singing. Welcome to Worship at Fields United Methodist Church this morning. We are so glad to have all of you here worshiping with us. I see so much um, red and festive clothing. I just love it. We are all ready for Christmas Eve tonight. Um, we have candlelight worship services tonight at 7.30 and at 10 o'clock. So if you want to come back, it'll be a whole different service because today is also actually still the fourth Sunday of Advent, which is a neat thing. That only happens every seven years. So that's sort of cool. You have Christmas Eve and Advent 4 all on the same day. Um, we have just a quick a few announcements. Um, we are not meeting next Wednesday for our Wednesday evening services. We're taking a little break. And then when we come back in the new year, the first Wednesday in January, the service time will change to 6.30. So all are welcome. It's a great way to recharge and refresh your spirit in the middle of the week. Sometimes it's hard to get to church on Sundays because I have kids. I know how it is. There's always sports and things nowadays, so it gives you an extra opportunity to worship as well. We have a wonderful Disciple Bible Study class that also meets on Wednesday evenings. They'll start at 5 o'clock, and it's led by Dick and Lorna Laver. It's a wonderful way to really deepen your knowledge of the Bible. Um, it's, it's really fun, too. You really get to know the people in your group very well. It um, is an intentional disciple-making class. So if you are interested in more information about that, come see me. I'll make sure you have a book. That will also start um, the first Wednesday in January. And then we are starting a Sunday school class on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock for our kindergarten to fifth graders. And um, I would like to set it up as a rotational kind of thing where us each week, it's wonderful for kids to be exposed to different influences as they grow in their faith and mature as disciples. And the more people we have in the rotation, um, the less often you will teach. So we have a great curriculum to follow. Everything will be provided for you. If this is something you've always wanted to try, this is an easy way to try it because you can do it once and see how it goes for you and I can guarantee you'll love it. Now, I know that Pat and Dave had an announcement also. Can you please come up? If we could have Pastor Tom come up as well. Oh. And for you to be here, that's fine. So on behalf of our church congregation, the Saints here at Field, we just wanted to say, we want to say thank you for all you've done for us this past year. And wish you guys a happy holiday season. And we have a little something for you here. And we just want to say we're glad that we both have you in our, in our lives. So thank you so much from the church. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, church. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and now let's engage in some wonderful carol singing. Um, if you, I think it will be a projected up on the screen. The first um, song that we'll sing together is Away in a Manger. So you can stay seated to sing it or you can stand, because I always think we sing better when we stand. <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> I feel like they want to sit. <laughs>
The next hymn will be number 230, verses 1 and 3, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And finally, we will sing number 234, O Come All Ye Faithful. We'll do verses 1, 3, and 4. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of joy. We light it in all the candles of hope and peace again as we remember that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and bring us everlasting peace and joy. The fourth candle of Advent is the candle of love. God's love is a perfect love. It holds nothing back. God in love gives us everything we need 
to live a life of hope and peace. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whomever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus shows us God's perfect love. This is what love is like. Love is patient, love is kind, and envy knows and envies no one. Love is never boastful or conceited or rude or selfish. Love is not quick to take offense. It keeps no records of wrongs. It does not gloat over other people's troubles, but rejoices in the right, the good, and the true. There is nothing that love cannot face there is no limit to its faith, to its hope, to its endurance. Love never ends. We light the candle of love to remind us that Jesus brings God's love and shows us how to love others. Love is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the love we find in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the love you give us. We ask that we wait for all your promises to come true and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word, and to do your will by sharing your love with each other. We ask this in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Please remain standing for the uh, opening prayer. Lord, as And now sing with us hymn number 227, The Friendly Beast.
You may be seated. It is good even on a morning like this, and especially on a morning like this, to take our joys and our concerns to God. On this morning, I would ask special prayers for Ken Murta, who is recovering after surgery. He had a hip replacement, so please keep him and his family in your prayers. Um, also play, pray for Nancy Fortune. She ended up going back to the hospital this week, and she is recovering and doing much better, so please keep them in your family as well. Are there any other prayer concerns or joys that you would like to share this morning? Jafar. Oh, gosh. Jennifer's father-in-law is in the hospital with pneumonia. What's his name? John Brailer. John Brailer. Please keep John Brailer in your prayers. Prayers for John, Jennifer. Anyone else? Spots family. Please pray for the Spots family. Scott is a young man. He's got young children. What did you say? Seven. Seven and five years old. He has leukemia that just returned, and it's pretty aggressive. They're hoping he can go to Chicago for special treatment, but the prognosis so far is not very good. So please keep this family in your prayers. They could really use it. Prayers for the Spots family, absolutely. Anyone else? Morning, Jean. Good to see you here. Good morning. Good morning, one and all. I uh, have a certain praise uh, that my uh, leg has been diagnosed as weight bearing. Uh, it's a lot of crutches and it's healing. Uh, I would like to thank one and all for the many prayers, concerns, uh, those persons who took Edna to and from the hospital to uh, visit me in my ordeal. Uh, for a good cup of coffee that Mike Kelly brought to me, it was definitely good. And uh, among all and others, uh, just after I had the accident and I was laying in the emergency room, when Pastor Tom came into that emergency room, just a matter of a few short minutes after I got there, I knew things would be much better at all. Mm -hmm. so again, thank you one and all. Amen. That is a praise. We're glad to see you here today. We're glad to see Edna, too. It's a wonderful blessing that you are on the mend. Anyone else have a prayer to share? I'm not missing anyone. Well, then, let's go to God in prayer. Lord Jesus, on this wonderful, glorious morning, we celebrate you. You are the word. You were present at the beginning of time. You were with God and you were God. You are the source of everything. Jesus, you brought life and light for all persons into this world. Your light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot ever extinguish your light. Jesus, shine your light on your people and fill us with your light so that we may shine it on others as well. But Lord, we fall short. We make mistakes and we miss the mark. Forgive us, we pray. In spite of our shortcomings, you continue to seek us out, to love us, to pour your grace into us. On the night of your birth, the whole company of heaven filled the night to sing praises to you. It is right to praise you, Lord, to praise you for the mercies and the blessings and the love and the grace that you pour into us every moment of our lives. We are never alone, never abandoned. We walk in joy assured of your everlasting presence through every chapter and verse of our lives. Lord, we pray for those who are hurting, those who suffer illness or injury. We pray for those who have deep sorrow. We pray for those who are feeling lost and alone. We pray for those who could not be here today. We pray for those who have yet to find you. Pour your grace and mercy on them. May they feel your loving arms and healing, comforting presence. Lord, we also pray for those who are celebrating joys today. 
as we know that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Lord, we pray for our protectors, for the healers, for the caregivers. Give them wisdom and discernment. Lord, help us to be a blessing to others as we seek out the least and the lost. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us to strengthen us for the work ahead. Fill us with mercy and grace for others, for we have received your mercy and grace in abundance. Help us to be bringers of justice and bright beacons of your light in this dark and hurting world. Fill us with your hope, love, joy, and peace as we prepare to celebrate your birth. Hear us now as we pray boldly together that prayer that you taught your disciples so long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, Our ushers will now come forward um, for the offering. Lord God, you are indeed the giver of every good and perfect gift. Please accept these gifts given to you with thankful, grateful hearts as your grateful people. May they be a blessing both to those who give them as well as to those for whom they were given for the advancement of your kingdom in this world. In your holy name we pray, amen. Scripture reading for today is Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who lived in a land of deep shadows, light, some bursts of light. You repopulated the nation. You expanded its joy. Oh, you're so glad in your presence. Festival joy. The joy of a great celebration, sharing rich gifts and warm greetings, the abuse of oppressors and cruelty of tyrants, of their whips and cudgels and curses, is gone, done away with a deliverance, as surprising and sudden as Gideon's old victory over Medan, the boots of all those invading troops, 
along with their shirts soaked with innocent blood, will be piled in a heap and burned, a fire that will burn for days, for a child has been born for us, the gift of a son for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Holiness. His ruling authority will grow, and there will be no limits to the holiness he brings. He'll ru rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put that kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going, with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always. Zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. I would now like to invite all the children and the youth to please come forward. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. Gather over here. Come on. Oh, we have lots of people. This is great. So, have you ever seen one of these before? If you were here last year, you know what this is. Who knows what this is called? Yes? Chris Tingle. Do you know why it's called a Chris Tingle? No, not Santa Claus. It sounds, that's Chris Kringle. <laughs> But close, though. Actually, it's from a German word that means Christ, but is Christkindl, which means Christ child. So this is a special tradition that's for children in the church. The Moravian church started it in the 1700s, and it's kind of special. So now you'll notice it's sort of weird looking, too, right? This is, this is kind of an odd looking thing, isn't it? You guys can kind of see. It's very pretty, but it's sort of odd looking. So let me tell you what all the pieces and parts are about. So the orange is the world. And the candle is Jesus Christ. And what happens when we light a candle? What does it make? Light. Yes, because Jesus Christ was the light of the world. See that? Look at that. Then there's a red ribbon all around the world because that shows that Jesus came for all people to save all people. When Jesus died on the cross and he bled, that reminds us of the blood of Jesus. Now look at all these yummy things poked on sticks in here. You guys see that? Look at, does that look delicious? This is the four corners of the world, north, east, south, and west. It's also the four seasons, summer, winter, fall, and spring. The good things on it, the yummy things, are all the blessings and the bounties that God gives to us every day because God cares for the whole entire world. So isn't that kind of neat? So here's what we're going to do. I want you guys to line up from shortest to tallest all down this center aisle. See if you guys can figure that out. You can do it. I think Jackson might be the shortest. <laughs> come on, guys, come up in front. You guys get to be first, okay? Come on. Hi. All right. Right here. You are the front of the line, okay? Everybody line up right behind Emma, okay? Line up behind Emma. Now, while we do their thing with their um, Chris Tingle lighting, you guys will have a special song to sing that will be up on the, bo um, on the projection for you. So you guys, they will sing a song while you guys come up here and do your special thing, okay?
one to you? Make Jesus. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verse 1 through 20, and I'll be reading from the Common English Bible Translation. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. This first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. Big names. Everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and his family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city called Bethlehem. And this was in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage and who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger, 
because there was no place for them at the guest room. Nearby, shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angels stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. Look, I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly in a manger. Suddenly, a great assembly of the heavenly forces was with the angel, praising God. They said, glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. When the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go right now to Bethlehem and see what's happened. Let's confirm what the Lord has revealed to us. They went quickly and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they saw this, they reported what they had been told about this child. Everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds told them. Mary committed these things to memory and considered them carefully. The shepherds returned home, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and all they had seen. Everything happened just as they had been told. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Lord, this day we gather to learn about your word, to celebrate your hope, your love, your joy, and your peace, and to leave this place filled with the Spirit so that we can do your work in the kingdom. Open our hearts and our minds to hearing your message today. May it speak boldly and loudly to us. May we be changed by what we hear. May your words come through me or in spite of me. As we get ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, may we know your love and share it freely with everyone we meet. Amen. Now, who likes being chosen for stuff? Let me see. Put your hands up high if you like being chosen for stuff. Yeah, I kind of like being chosen for stuff too. Now, how do you feel when you are not chosen? Who wants to tell me how they feel when they're not chosen? Emma, how do you feel? You feel sad? How do you feel, Nadia? Disappointed? Does anyone feel a different way? I mean, it's not fun to not be chosen, right? Not at all. The world can seem so unfair sometimes, because sometimes it seems like it's always all the same people that get picked for stuff, right? They get picked for all the good stuff. And then it's always the same people that never get picked. And when we don't get picked for stuff, it's random sometimes, because it just it happens that someone's in the right place at the right time. Other times it's specific, because you pick people because they can do something really well, or you pick someone because you know them well. But it is disappointed, and it feels awful to get left out. But it feels really special to be picked too, doesn't it? Who feels special, special if they get picked? Yeah, I do. I love being picked for things. Now, being chosen by people is very different from how God chooses. God does it very differently. God chooses everyone. No one is ever left out because God does not play favorites. God loves each and every one of us exactly the same. Now, we know that we've all been chosen for special jobs in the kingdom of God, and we all have different jobs to do. But God chooses us in a different way as well, not just for what we are supposed to do, but to choose us because God loves us. God cares about us and for us. God wants to save us. God chooses us to show us that we are very important, important enough to send Jesus down to live among us. When God sent Jesus to the world, God chose us. Now Jackson this morning from the book of Isaiah read a very special prophecy. And this was one that actually foretold the coming of the Savior. The world was a dark place, and not dark because the sun didn't shine. It wasn't like that. It was dark because people were doing all the wrong things. They were struggling to love God. They were struggling to love each other. And therefore, the world was kind of crazy because there was a lot of bad stuff going on. But all that was about to end because according to this prophecy, a baby would be born. A tiny baby, but a very special baby that would save us all by bringing God's light back into this dark, dark, broken world. A baby that would grow up and teach everyone what it meant to live in God's light. 
who would teach us about God's love for us, how to love God better, and because God loves us, how to love each other better. I bet people were so excited for good news like that. Does that sound like good news? It absolutely does. Yes, it does. I mean, they were probably really excited and hoping for a better future when the amazing counselor, the Prince of Peace, would come into the world and, and kind of fix things. This little baby would grow up to change the world forever. The birth of this child was a sign that God had chosen us, but the time was not right yet. God had a perfect plan for when and how Jesus would be born in the world. So now we fast forward to the Gospel of Luke, where we read the story of Jesus' birth. Now Mary and Joseph, they had to travel a long, long way. How many of you travel, when you go on vacation, you ride a donkey? Do you ride a donkey on vacation? What do you, ride, what do, you do in vacation? Ben rides a donkey, he says. <laughs> what color is your donkey, Ben? It's a red donkey. Very good. <laughs> Most of you probably go in a car, but Mary and Joseph didn't have a car. They had to ride on a donkey and they had to go very far. And not only did they have to go very far, but when they got there, there was already a whole bunch of other people that had traveled from far away to be counted in this census. Because that's what a census is. It's counting people. The Romans wanted to know how many people were living in their empire so they could make up a tax rate. Great reason. But anyway, so they get to Bethlehem and there's absolutely nowhere for them to stay. And poor Mary, she's about to have her baby. So what happens? A kindly innkeeper says, well, you know what? I have a stable out back. It's probably not ideal because, you know, that's where we keep the cows and the sheep. But you can use it because at least it's warm and it has a roof over it. So that's where Jesus was born. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords was born in a stable. And because they didn't have a nice crib to put Jesus in, Mary had to put Jesus in the manger, which is a feeding trough. That's where they put the hay for the cows and the sheep to eat. So that's where she laid Jesus down. Now I bet that Joseph, because he was a carpenter, that means he makes things out of wood. He makes tables and chairs and mangers and things. But I bet you he had a beautiful crib that he had already made, but it was back home in Nazareth. So this little battered old feeding trough would just have to do for now. Now, were any of you born in a stable? I know sometimes your moms probably tell you that you were born in a barn when you leave the doors open, yes? But none of you were born in a stable. Most of you were probably born in a nice hospital. I also don't think your mom said to put you in a manger because when you came home, there was probably a very nice crib at your house with cute little sheets and stuffed animals, right? Nice and cozy, all decorated. The birth of Jesus was all part of God's perfect plan, though. Everything about Jesus, from the minute the angel came to tell Mary that God had chosen her to be Jesus' mother, to the surprising announcement to the group of shepherds, all of it was part of God's perfectly laid out plan to let the world know that this baby, even though he was the Son of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Gods, God himself, this little baby came for every single person on earth. Let's look at God's plan a little bit. So God chose Mary. Mary was a young girl, and she wasn't famous. She wasn't important. She wasn't rich. She wasn't really particularly special in any way. I mean, she was a girl like everybody else. She was really, really ordinary. And then she was engaged to Joseph, who was a carpenter, and he was really ordinary too. I mean, a carpenter isn't a fancy, glamorous job, so they were probably just regular people. And it's interesting that God chose Mary and Joseph out of all the people in Israel because they were so very ordinary. But we know that God looks at more than what's on the outside. God sees inside of our hearts. God sees special things. And God could see in the hearts of Mary and Joseph that they would just be the exactly perfect people to raise baby Jesus. Now then, the fact that Jesus was born in a stable was an important part of God's plan too. Now, usually, when a new prince or a new princess is born, it's a big thing, okay? They have a special wing at the hospital, and when the baby is born, they immediately let the queen know, and they tell all the important people first, and then the whole news media is there. And instantly, the whole world knows that this little prince or princess was born. Do you guys remember when Prince George was born? And Princess Charlotte in England? I mean, we live in America. They're not even our prince and princess, but we all knew about it. 
It was beamed around the world on every news station. Now, that's not what happened when Jesus was born. First of all, a stable is nothing like that fancy hospital wing, is it? How many of you have been to a farm? Who's been to a farm? Come on, I've been to a farm. Did you walk by where the animals lived? What does it smell like? Does it smell nice? I mean, even a little nice? No? Stinky, right? That's where the animals live. It's kind of stinky. That's what the stable probably smelled like. It probably didn't smell very pretty. It's not exactly very glamorous. Now, the news media was not waiting right outside to beam the excited news to the whole world on every media station that they could, the internet and Twitter and CNN and everything else. The paparazzi wasn't there to start snapping pictures of the Son of God. No, there were no messengers that were sent to run and tell the high priests and the king of Israel that this Messiah was born. None of that happened. It was a relatively quiet affair. Jesus was quietly born among animals, softly mooing and banging and hee-hawing. He was quietly born with just Joseph and Mary and those animals to see. But of course, this is all part of God's perfect plan. God needed the world to know that Jesus did not come only for those who always get chosen. The important people, the popular people, the high priests and the kings, the dignitaries and the emissaries. No, Jesus came for everyone, everyone. From the most important person in the land down to the very least important, most often forgotten person of all. God could have announced this special event to anyone God chose. And guess who God chose? God chose the people who were almost never even thought of. Who would normally never be the first people to be told any important news. The ones whom everyone sort of forgets about because they're so very unimportant in society. God carefully chose the people who would be able to really send the message that Jesus would not be the sole property of the ones who always control everything and decides who has access and who doesn't. So God chose to tell a group of shepherds in a field. Now, we don't think very badly of shepherds. We think they're pretty okay. But in those days, I'll tell you what, shepherds were on the very bottom rung of society. Everybody kind of looked down on shepherds. I mean, they had a dirty job. They were considered to be unclean and untrustworthy. And people were not very nice to shepherds at all. They didn't really let them participate in much. It's kind of sad. Now, when we read the Old Testament and we read about Joseph and his brothers, shepherds were super important at one point. I mean, they were the important guys and they all were shepherds. But as Israel started living in cities and they started planting crops, being a shepherd got to be something that wasn't so cool to do anymore. So, now, we find these poor shepherds out in a field in the middle of the night. I can imagine they're probably sitting around their little fire trying to find a comfortable spot among the rocks and the grass. They were probably hoping that there wouldn't be any wolves that would come up and snatch a sheep at night because then they'd have to try to fight it off. Maybe they were thinking about their families or dreaming of sleeping in a nice warm bed. Maybe they were kind of thinking about the fact that they might need a bath soon. You know... They may even have been thinking about the fact that it would be awesome to be chosen for something important for once. To be treated like a person instead of an outcast. So here they were in the field because someone had to stay with the sheep to protect them and keep them safe, even at night. And boy, were these shepherds in for a huge surprise. Now, I want you guys to help me do something. Everyone, I want you to close your eyes. Are you good at imagination? Close your eyes tight. I want you to picture yourself, and it's dark. The sky is clear, and there's some scars twinkling in the sky. And all around you, all you can hear is the sheep kind of moving around and going, bah, bah, maybe softly, right? And you can hear the fire kind of crackling. You can feel the warmth of the fire on your feet. All right, it's quiet, it's peaceful. Maybe you hear a cricket or a night bird. Nothing else is going on. It's just peaceful and quiet. So you're just sort of alone with your thoughts. All of a sudden, an angel pops into the scene, appearing before you, shining brightly with God's great big light. Can you imagine? That's kind of a scary thing because you don't see angels every day, so you don't know what this angel's going to tell you. But the angel has very special news just for your ears, your ears only. 
The angel tells you not to be afraid because he was bringing you wonderful, joyous news. News that was for everyone. Jesus was born. He was in a stable in Bethlehem. And right now, if you wanted to, you could go and see him and say, kind of look at the baby. Now imagine that all of a sudden there's not one angel, but the entire sky, every inch of it is filled with the, all these bright, shining angels. So many that you can't even count them. And they are singing and they are praising God. And it's something like nothing you've ever seen in your whole life. Gloria in excelsis Deo. Glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth among those whom God favors. And then suddenly they're gone. And the sky is dark and everything's quiet once again. Okay, you can open your eyes. Imagine what it must have felt like for those humble shepherds, despised by everyone else, to be chosen by God, to be the very first ones to hear God's joyous good news. The angel told them that this news was for all people, including them, including the ones who feel like they don't count, like they don't matter all that much. Can you imagine how excited they were? The angel's song after that confirmed that that special message that God sent peace on earth among those whom God favors, that God clearly favored them too, even though no one else did. So everything, everything that happened on that special night was very carefully planned out by God. Nothing was left to chance. Not one little detail, because God was sending a very loud message to all people. God was the God of everyone. God is the God of everyone. Jesus came to save everyone. No one would be left out, especially not those who always seems to be left out. God loved the world and everyone in it, everyone, all people, from the lowliest shepherd to the mightiest king, and no one would ever be left out with Jesus, not one single person. And by telling these shepherds first, the ones who might not even have heard the news until weeks and weeks later, if it was up to anyone else maybe, God sent that message loud and clear. And so what did these shepherds do? Did they just hang out in the field? No, they left their sheep. They went right away to go see this baby. They, they followed all the directions that the angel gave them, and they found the little baby in Bethlehem, in the stable, just like the angel said. Can you imagine how special it must have been for these guys to come in and be the very first people, other than Mary and Joseph, to lay eyes on the baby Jesus, to see the face of God, for the first time in their lives, they had been chosen to be the ones to see something first. Now this was good news they couldn't keep to themselves. I can imagine the bounce in their step as they're almost skipping back to the field, telling everyone who would listen about this amazing thing that they had just seen, this amazing thing that had just happened. And for the first time ever, people were listening to them. People were paying attention and getting excited with them. And Jesus continued to challenge the way that people look at one another. Today, we don't think badly of shepherds at all. Remember, I said we don't really mind shepherds. I remember when my brother was really small. I think he was maybe four or five. He told his teacher that he was going to be a shepherd when he grew up. He was tickled pink about that. I mean, so we don't think badly about shepherds. I mean, in fact, Jesus himself called himself the good shepherd, loving and caring for us just as a shepherd loves and cares for the, their sheep. Jesus guides us and walks with us, leading us in good paths. If only we will follow him. Jesus came into the world and changed the way we think about everything. Jesus always told people that the least would be the greatest and the last would be first. And it began to be that way on the very night of his birth, when the least and the last, these humble shepherds, were the first ones to be told the greatest news of all time. Christ the Lord is born this day and he came for all people. So have you guessed yet what today's message to you is all about? While we may sometimes feel like a shepherd, sometimes we feel forgotten and thrown away, never picked for anything important. We may sometimes think that we're not all that special, but God wants you to know that God always chooses you, just like God chose the shepherds on that night. God chose you when Jesus was born in a smelly stable in Bethlehem. God chose you when the angels came to tell the shepherds that this baby was born. The least in society, the least important people of all, that this little baby was born for them and for everyone. 
They were made to feel like they mattered. God chose you as Mary sat there quietly smiling to herself, sort of just watching all this unfold, thinking about the amazing ways in which God works. God chose you when Jesus died for your sins on a cross. God chose you when Jesus rose on the third day and promised us eternal life in him. God chooses you every day, every moment of your life. You are extremely important to God because you are God's beloved children. Jesus came to shine God's light into a dark and broken world. Jesus came to teach us how to love God better, how to love each other better. Jesus came to tell us that God chose us. So what should we do? Well, we choose hope. We choose love. We choose joy. We choose peace. We choose Jesus. We choose God. Because God, long before we ever existed, God chose you. And God continues to choose you always. Amen. Please stand as we sing the final hymn, number 238, Angels We Have Heard on High. You have been chosen by God. Go now, humble shepherds, proclaiming the good news of great joy to all people. Jesus Christ is born. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you 
and give you peace. Amen.